curses, insanity, and demons that roam the dark forest shadows. A place Dan Aykroyd calls the scariest place on Earth. But even with all of that drama, all I can say is it's the biggest hullabaloo over a town that wasn't even a town I've ever seen. Welcome to The In-Between. I'm Caroline, and today we're diving into the secrets of the Dark Entry Forest, home to the infamous Dudleytown, Connecticut. So, if Dudleytown wasn't a town, then what was it? Well, it's an area that is part of Cornwall Township in Connecticut, inhabited by Dudleys. Lots of Dudleys. It all starts in 1747, when Gideon Dudley buys some land outside the town of Cornwall. By 1753, Gideon's two brothers, Barzillai and Abiel Dudley, buy more land nearby. A few years later, another Dudley, Martin, also joins the clan. Like I said, lots of Dudleys. So Dudleytown becomes Dudleytown not because it's a real town, but because of the number of Dudleys. In fact, Dudleytown never has any stores or churches. Everyone has to go down the hill to Cornwall for all of their goods and services, even their cemetery. Originally, it's a farming community, although that turns out to be a very poor decision on the part of the Dudleys. The land they choose to start their farms on is located right smack in the middle of a bunch of mountains. Word has it that it starts getting dark by noon. And the land is super rocky. According to Isaac Stiles, an early Dudleytown resident, nature out of her boundless store threw rocks together and did no more. Not to mention that it's Connecticut. It's got a longer growing season than Alaska. And it's not Mississippi either. None of these things bode well for good, healthy crops. But over the years, they're joined by a few more families. And then... Iron ore is discovered nearby, and along with some lumber sales, Dudleytown has a little boom. At its height, it boasts 26 families. Not bad for a town that's not really a town. And I hear y'all barking at me out there, yelling, where's the spooky stuff? Well, the Dudleys are the spooky stuff. They're cursed. A curse that goes back 250 years in their family to their forefather, Edmund Dudley, who was beheaded in 1510 for treason against King Henry VIII, which wasn't really treason at all. See, Edmund had been the money guy for King Henry VII and had become pretty wealthy himself in the process. When King Henry VII dies and is replaced by King Henry VIII, lots of people in his court don't like the way Edmund is spending his own money. So they trump up some treason charges and chop his head off. Interestingly enough, Edmund's son, John Dudley, orphaned at the age of seven, grows up to become pretty tight with Henry VIII for the last few years of Henry's reign. Couple that with his years of service to the crown, John finds himself as the regent, or kind of a, a temporary governor, for the new King Edward VI, who's only 12. So basically, he's running England. And he likes it. A little too much. Edward has two half-sisters, Mary I and Elizabeth I. Because remember, Henry VIII had six wives, but the sisters were both considered illegitimate because Henry had both of those marriages annulled. Seeing ahead a couple of moves, John has his son Guilford marry Lady Jane Grey, great-granddaughter of Henry VII. And with Mary and Elizabeth cut out of the line of secession, next in line for the throne. Six weeks later, Edward VI dies and Lady Jane becomes queen for nine whole days. Mary I says, I don't think so, and manages to persuade the Privy Council, which is a group that mainly exists to advise either the king or the queen, to back her as the rightful heir. And just like that, Lady Jane, Guilford, and his dad, John, all lose their heads as well. Couple the three generations of Dudley heads in baskets with the story that one of Guilford's brothers, who was a military officer, comes home from France with the plague. 
not the plague, but a plague that only kills maybe thousands instead of the 25 million killed by the Black Plague, but still slightly embarrassing. And voila, the Dudley family is proclaimed as being cursed. Another of Guilford's brothers, Robert, decides it's getting a little hot in the kitchen and gets the hell out of Dodge. A couple of Dudley generations later, William Dudley boards a ship bound for the New World and settles in Connecticut. He has a son, William, who has a son, Joseph, who has 12 kids, three of which are the three Dudley boys that settle in Dudley Town, bringing the curse with them. But things are pretty quiet for a while until Gershon Hollister, neighbor and friend to Abiel Dudley, is accidentally killed during a barn raising for or murdered in the house of, not sure which story to believe here, one William Tanner. The next thing you know, Tanner is going off about demons in the woods and goes insane. And Abiel grief-stricken from losing his friend Gershon, soon follows suit and becomes a ward of the town of Cornwall. His house and his land are sold to raise money for the town to take care of him. The house is bought by Nathaniel Carter, who comes to town in 1759. In 1774, a random plague takes the lives of his kin, the Adoniram Carter family. Not being able to shake the tragedy, Nate picks up his family and leaves town. But the curse follows him. He moves to the Delaware wilderness outside of colonial control. He, his wife, and their newborn child are killed by Indians who kidnap their other three children and take them to Canada and ransom the two girls. But the boy, Nathaniel, remains and marries into the tribe. Next on the tragedy bus is Dudley Town's most famous inhabitant, General Herman Swift, who served in the Revolutionary War under George Washington himself. He moves into a house on the outskirts of Dudley Town at the top of Bald Mountain. In April of 1804, his wife, Sarah Fay, is standing on their front porch during a storm and is struck by lightning, killing her instantly. After which... General Swift is reported to become slightly demented. Another passenger on the crazy train. The population steadily decreases through the 1800s. Some attribute the demise of the town to multiple mundane factors. The depletion of farmland, the decline of the area's iron industry, and the natural progression of citizens following the seductive promise of an easier life out west rather than trying to farm crops with no sun, which even persuades the families of Abiel's brothers, Gideon and Barzillai. But the late 1890s, one of the last residents is John Patrick Brophy, whose wife dies of consumption, which is just a nice way of saying tuberculosis. Then his two sons walk into the woods never to be seen again. Now, it sounds like they did this on purpose, more of a going on the lamb kind of situation because they were both being accused of theft. But the theft they are accused of was for some sleigh blankets. Really? You're going to leave behind your family and everything you own to avoid the three whole weeks in jail for that major offense? I'll let you decide for yourself if that makes any sense. In any case, John's house then burns to the ground and he walks into the forest, never to be seen again. That's pretty much the end of Dudley Town's full-time residence. But the beauty and simplicity of life in the Cornwall area becomes a magnet for New York's wealthy to come and spend their summers. One such couple is William and Harriet Clark. William is the professor of surgery at Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons and the leading oncologist in New York. In 1906, he and Harriet take a trip to the Cornwall area, discover the Dark Entry Forest, which is the name of the forest surrounding Dudley Town, and fall in love with its trout-filled streams and mellow owl orchestra. 
they immediately cough up the cash to buy a thousand acres, including Dudley Town, and get to work planning their dream second home in the woods. But that process takes a little longer than they thought it would. William can't find a builder. Of course, he thinks it's because the proposed building site is a little ways off the road. It's not the easiest access and that the local builders just don't want to deal with the extra hassle. So having dabbled in several different trades before becoming a doctor, including carpentry, William decides, I'll just build it myself. And he does. And by all accounts, the couple is very happy there, spending as many weekends and holidays there as they can. But in 1918, life catches up with them, and William is called back to the city for some kind of emergency. Harriet obviously doesn't want him to go, and the thought of being in the woods all by herself kind of freaks her out a little bit. But William promises he'll be back as soon as he can and jumps on the next train heading to the city. About 36 hours later, William comes back to the cabin to find his wife curled up in the corner, hysterical, rambling about being attacked by demons from the woods. The couple goes back to New York, where Harriet is reported to commit suicide sometime later. But this does not stop William from continuing to visit his forested retreat. And in 1924, he and some other area landowners formed the Dark Forest Entry Association with the stated purpose of preserving the land in its natural state. That association still maintains control of the land to this day. So how much of this is true? All of it? None of it? All of it? All of it! Well... Like most good stories, depends on who you talk to. If you talk to Reverend Gary P. Dudley, a descendant of the Dudley Town Dudleys, none of it. He even wrote a book called The Legend of Dudley Town, Connecticut, solving legends through genealogical and historical research with a more factual account of the area's history. According to Reverend Gary, the people are real, but the legends are not. They're just natural occurrences blown completely out of proportion. He says the hysteria all began when a man named Edward C. Starr, who wrote a book called A History of Cornwall, Connecticut, a typical New England town, included a two-page section in the book he called Doom of Dudley Town, where he proceeded to inexplicably make up a bunch of nonsense about the town's history. First of all, according to Reverend Dudley's research, the Dudleys are not related to Edmund Dudley. So the curse may be real, but it's on different Dudleys. Second, he says that people who allegedly went nuts were people that lived to a very old age and that dementia is a very real side effect for many who live that long. And Sarah Faye Swift? Well, The odds are 1 in 15,300 that you will be struck by lightning in your lifetime. About 270 people are struck each year in the U.S. alone. And people had not begun to use lightning rods on houses yet. So getting struck by lightning was, and is, not necessarily uncommon. He says Harriet Clark, wife of William Clark, is known to have had some kind of pre-existing condition, although nobody knows if it was a physical or a mental condition, but that she did commit suicide in New York because she could no longer deal with the pain of whatever it is that she was suffering from. Also, some suggest that perhaps the water in the area had high metal content, thereby leading to some kind of toxicity. And while we know that the area is known for its iron ore deposits, it is extremely unlikely that anyone would have gotten iron toxicity from the drinking water. Not to mention the fact that the symptoms of iron poisoning do not include anything close to dementia. It is possible the water is contaminated with something else, but At this point, I would think that the state of Connecticut has run testing on every water source in the state, and we would know by now if the water in the area has tested positive for lead 
or any other hazardous substances. Okay, that information is certainly food for thought. And it certainly is possible that details have been exaggerated over the years for the sake of a good story. But what about today? What about the stories that haven't been colored by time? Keep in mind, I'm using the term today a little loosely since the area has been closed to the public for the last number of years with much stricter policing in the last 10 to 20. If you decide to go check it out, you'd better either sharpen your ninja stuff skills or be prepared to be arrested and or fined for trespassing. But there certainly are a few relatively modern tales we can go to for boots on the ground information. And the one thing that keeps coming up over and over is how quiet it is. Many people who have braved the threats of either arrest or demon attack report that once you get into the trees, a stifling stillness envelops you. And if that's not creepy enough, people have reported numerous physical experiences. Things like cold spots, slaps by invisible hands, pushes and shoves, shadowy figures creeping around the woods. Some even caught on camera. No, what is that? In the early 1970s, the famous, or infamous, depending on your opinion of them, demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren videotaped a Halloween special from Dudley Town. They declared it demonically possessed. Ed Warren said Dudley Town was controlled by something terrifying. Now, perhaps you're asking yourself, if the curse isn't true, where would all these modern day experiences be coming from? Well, it shouldn't be a surprise that the land was once covered by Native Americans. In fact, there are at least five tribes that call Connecticut their stomping grounds, and then tribes within those tribes. And considering the size of the state, there are probably burial grounds all over the place. And the Native Americans will be the first to tell you that bad things happen if you mess with their burial grounds. Now, if you want to take a trip to Conspiracy Town, plenty of people will tell you that the first stop is the Dark Entry Forest Association. Who exactly are these people and why won't they let the public anywhere near Dudley Town? In their defense, the release of the movie The Blair Witch Project apparently sparked a fresh wave of ghost hunters and thrill seekers that did nothing but trash the place. That's when they went into DEFCON 5 alert status that they are still in today. And I can't say that I blame them necessarily. The whole point of the association was to keep the land pristine for future generations. Or was it? Some people think that there is more to it than that that the association knows something about that land that they want to keep secret. Freedom of Information Act requests go unanswered. The town of Cornwall says they have no land survey information on record, and details about the association itself are hard to find. Why the secrecy? What do they know that we don't? Just the act of telling people that they can't come makes them want to come even more. So if their sole aim is to keep people away, they're doing just the opposite. If they would reverse course and maybe offer guided tours or something, they would take away that innate reaction of defiance that is human nature. Maybe even make some bank to boot. That way, if the tours end up being uneventful, people will get bored and move off to the next creepy thing. But if they are eventful, if physical experiences continue to happen, don't you think that might be important information for the rest of us? That we might just want to know that a place exists that might help prove what happens to the soul when the body is long gone. Extra special shout out to our first humanitarian level member, Rich G. Thanks, Rich. So what's your take? Real? Not so real? Let us know in the comments down below. 
Speaking of strange family tragedies, this video is an epic deep dive into one of the craziest family murder mysteries of them all. You do not want to miss it. Until next time, be careful out there. And I will see you here again on The In-Between.